My name is Malcolm Dando. I'm Professor of International Security in the University of Bradford in the UK. But I should stress that by original training, I'm a biologist. And therefore, I come at this question really from the point of view of a scientist. It's a pleasure to be able to contribute this lecture to this series on research, ethics, and social impact series. I understand that one of the previous lectures mentioned the um, misuse of information technology in regard to the development of uh, autonomous drones. What I'd like to do in this lecture is to widen out this discussion of dual use and to consider the possibility that advances in neuroscience could, if we're not careful, lead to the development of novel chemical and biological weapons. I should say at the start that uh, the discussion of dual use has been much more extensive in regard to the possible development of new biological weapons than it has in the world of information technology. Um, but there has been one problem in the way that discussion has developed, in my opinion, and that is that it's focused very often on single experiments. Should this particular scientist have done this particular experiment? Should this particular scientist have published this particular paper? And that has led, I think, to a, the unfortunate feeling amongst scientists that they are considered to be part of the problem. But we know that um, modern science doesn't just advance through the work of scientists. Other people are involved, like publishers, funders, uh, national policy makers, international diplomats, shape the way that modern science proceeds. And similarly, guarding myth the benignly intended science from misuse involves all of those people as well. And scientists can contribute their expertise both in making sure that they do responsible science in the lab, but also contributing their expertise to discussions of things like codes of conduct or oversight systems or development in international negotiations where their expertise is appropriate. So my main point in this lecture is to stress that what we have to take is this broad approach and consider the scientists to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. My lecture is in five parts. I start by very briefly running through the reasons I have for holding this broad view of dual use. Then, in a short, uh, concise manner, introducing the chemical and biological uh, disarmament regime as the background to what I want to say. Most of the presentation is in section C on the problems of dual use. And then I follow up in section D and E with two examples of where scientists can contribute their expertise. First of all, in a very specific way in regard to developments in the Chemical Weapons Convention, but then in a very much more broad way in regard to uh, chemical and biological weapons uh, restraining uh, possible developments there. So looking first at why we need to take a broad approach. Professor Mieselson, in the year 2000, contributed this essay to the Chemical and Biological Weapons Conventions Div Bulletin. And it, it was called Averting the Hostile Ex Exploitation of Biotechnology. And he stressed, as we would all understand now, I think, that during this century, we are going to get more and more capabilities to manipulate life. Obviously, what we're intending to do as scientists is to develop that capability for benign purposes. But what Mieselson pointed out also in this essay 
was that if those capabilities are misused for hostile purposes, then very unpleasant things could happen to human beings. Matt went on to point out that there are two very unusual characteristics of biotechnology when compared with previous uh, major technologies which have been misused. First of all, it's quite clear that these capabilities could be misused not just by large states, but by small groups of people and even perhaps by deranged individuals, which means that this is constraining the misuse of this technology is much more difficult than constraining, say, nuclear technology, where we could just make sure that people couldn't get their hands on uh, the essential materials. And also, as he pointed out, this technology will enable us to understand much more of who we are and what we understand ourselves to be. And this is very un unusual, again, for a technology. The point was made very, very clearly by an official paper by the United Kingdom for a meeting of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention state parties in 2012. And clearly, what they were worried about here was the implications of developments in neuroscience, the implication that these developments might be misused for hostile purposes. But they also stress two points, which are very important for us to understand. First of all, we do have time. We can, it's not as though a catastrophe is going to happen by the misuse of neuroscience tomorrow. We have time to put in the right kind of regulations and right kind of culture to make sure that these kind of misuses don't happen. And secondly, whilst we're doing that, we have to be very, very careful that we don't hamper the beneficial work that is intended to be done to help people, for instance, who have mental illnesses. Let's then turn to the question of the disarmament regime, the international regime, which is intended to prevent the misuse of the life sciences for hostile purposes in regard to chemical and biological weapons. During the First World War, as we all know, there was very extensive use of chemical weapons. It's much less well known that both sides in the First World War tried to use the growing understanding of microbiology to use infectious diseases to destroy the very important draft animal stocks of the other side. So both chemical and biological weapons were deployed and used during the First World War. And therefore, in 1925, the states managed to agree the 1925 Geneva Protocol, which banned both types of weapons. During the years between the First World War and the Second World War, lots of major states carried on work in both trying to develop chemical and biological weapons. The crucial change, though, was in the 1930s when civil work on pesticides led to Germany understanding the possibility of developing the very much more dangerous nerve agents, chemical nerve agents. During the Second World War, the United Kingdom managed to work out how to use biological weapons more effectively than had previously been understood by spreading the uh, germs on the air and then being inhaled. So uh, this led on then to major um, biological weapons programs which ran through the Cold War period. And essentially at the end of the Cold War, what we had was very large stocks of lethal 
chemical weapons available and some remains of the offensive biological weapons programs. There's one problem for scientists in understanding what's going on here in the sense that as scientists we understand toxins to be something which is external to the body but for the diplomats involved in the development of these the international regimes to constrain the misuse of chemistry and biology toxin has a different meaning so histamine is a natural substance a bioregulator in our bodies but if you get stung by a bee particularly if you're a person like me with extreme sensitivity it's a toxin <laughs> it really does cause a, a major effect so uh, the scientists have to understand that that here uh, toxin covers both the things that we will understand to be toxins and bioregulators so then the chemical and biological weapons threat spectrum extends from chemical weapons, the classical chemical agents such as nerve agents, through industrial chemicals like chlorine, which has been used very recently to attack people in Syria, then through what are called mid-spectrum agents, toxins and bioregulators, so something like uh, staphylococcal enterotoxin B, a, a toxin, or substance P, a bioregulator, would be included there. And then on to traditional biological weapons agents like Venezuelan encephalitis, uh, encephalitis and on to genetically modified biological agents. So that's the threat spectrum that uh, we have to consider here. And obviously some of those agents either directly or indirectly attack the nervous system. The Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention was agreed during the 1970s, and as you can see from its first article, it adds a series of other restraints to reinforce the 1925 Geneva Protocol. So what you're um, not allowed to do is to um, produce any quantities of... Uh, these kind of biological agents which don't have um, justification for prophylactic, protective or peaceful purposes. You can't develop, produce, stockpile or otherwise acquire or retain them. And the second part of Article 1 obviously covers the weapon systems as well. The Biological Weapons Convention is strong in establishing a norm but weak in implementation in that it doesn't have an effective verification system and it doesn't have a major international organization to take care of it between its five-year re review pro uh, conferences. The Chemical Weapons Convention, on the other hand, was agreed at the end of the Cold War in the 1990s and it is a much more complex beast. Uh, it again uh, adds uh, to the um, Geneva Protocol, you can't develop, produce, or otherwise acquire or retain chemical weapons. Um, but it has a very effective verification system which enabled us to get rid of almost all of the huge stocks of lethal chemical weapons developed during the Cold War period. And it has a big international organization located in The Hague which can, for instance, set up a scientific advisory board to assist the state parties in understanding the implications of the developments that are going on in the sciences at the present time. Turning then from that to the question of dual use in regard to our, our concern here about neuroscience and its possible misuse. This is a quotation from Bill Patrick, who was one of the major scientists in the US offensive biological weapons program during the period of the early Cold War. 
And what he's saying here is quite clear, that they manage to work out and field test a range of biological agents which and toxin agents which from the work they done clearly demonstrated that you could use biological weapons effectively against humans animals and plants no doubt about it whatsoever As an example, this is um, Ed Regis in his book, The Biology of Doom, uh, um, just uh, showing you what a uh, agent single weapon system could do in these field tests. So agent PG was staphylococcal enterotoxin B, and a single weapon system was a jet plane spraying this stuff in a line and the wind was taking it over the target area. And you can see quite clearly here that a very large area could uh, be affected and produce casualties by the use of this uh, agent. And of course from our point of view what's important is that SEB produced its incapacitation through the development in the victims of sickness behavior. So it was an indirect effect on the nervous system. The Soviet program ran, the American program ended in 69, essentially. The Soviet program ran further through the Cold War period. And this quotation is from a, a book uh, which gives us the best picture that we have in the open literature of the nature of the Soviet Offensive Biological Weapons Program by Milton Leitenberg and Ray Zelinkas, uh, published a couple of years ago. And here you can see that the scientists involved were using the current capabilities in genetic engineering to actually modify a biological agent so that it would induce a wreckage of the nervous system of the victim. So here's a clear example of the use of the, the currently best available um, life sciences for clear-cut hostile purposes. We've seen in Syria recently with the crude barrel bombs that a crude agent like chlorine, crudely delivered, can produce m major casualties uh, amongst people. And what we have to understand about these uh, Cold War period um, offensive programs is that they produced very sophisticated weapon systems to deliver the chemical and biological agents. And here's an example of BZ. Uh, BZ uh, was a drug being developed in the United States during the early Cold War period for gastrointestinal problems. It was discovered that very small amounts of this stuff caused all kinds of delirium in the people that they were treated. The drug was turned over to the US Army and developed as an incapacitating agent. It actually interfered with the acetylcholine neurotransmitter system in the body. Um, because they didn't understand enough about the diversity of the neurotransmitter systems at the time, the uh, results of uh, the use of BZ were extremely variable and it was never actually used as a weapon system because it was so variable. Uh, that was one of the reasons. But you can see from this quotation that there, there were very extensive efforts made to produce effective weapon systems uh, to deliver these kind of agents which attacked the nervous system. Military interest and military concern about attacks uh, using these kind of uh, 
agents which attack the nervous system um, continue. And this slide here just um, lists a number of really big, extensive studies carried out and published in the United States since the year 2000, uh, which um, clearly demonstrate just how uh, important an issue we're facing here about the possible malign misuse of the neurosciences. So just to take one of those uh, reports, the one on emerging cognitive neurosciences. And here are some examples of the kinds of things that they are worried about in that report. The use of neuropharmacological agents as incapacitants. New means of de uh, delivering these kind of agents. Agents which are highly potent um, and can go across the blood-brain barrier. All of these things are there at the present time causing concern amongst uh, people whose job it is to worry about these kinds of things. And it's not just theoretical. Here is uh, part of an analysis done by the UK's um, chemical defense uh, scientists at Port and Down. And they're looking in this paper at uh, an analysis of two survivors from the use of fentanyl derivatives to break the Moscow theater siege in 2002. And it's quite clear here that uh, the opioids, fentanyl, or derivatives, a mixture of derivatives of fentanyl, were used operationally to attack the hostage takers and, of course, also to uh, affect the hostages. And in fact, a very large number of people were saved, but a lar very large number of people were also killed by, and these are amongst the hostages, were killed by the use of the agent. I mentioned earlier on the scientific advisory board of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And they have looked at the kind of incapacitants that they know about from open literature. And the point that they make here in this slide is, in the view of the SAB, these are from the open literature. Most of the incapacitants with chemicals that are being discussed act centrally, target specific neuronal pathways in the brain, and all of them emerge from drug development programs, i.e. benignly intended work, from the period 1960s through to the 1980s. So here's the classic statement of a concern about dual use. And as I mentioned in regard to BZ, at the time that BZ was developed, we didn't know very much about the underlying neuronal ne networks in the brain that underlie our behavior. But here's a quotation from a major study done at the beginning of the US brain program, Brain 2025, A Scientific Vision, which makes it very, very clear that one of the major aims of the brain proje projects now is to understand those neuronal networks and how they work. And if I understand correctly from the collection of papers in Neuron in November of 2016, what we're seeing is not only the development of major programs in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in China, but they're all beginning to link together as well so that we are having, I think, an interlinked global program to further our under understanding of the way in which our nervous system, our central nervous system, shapes our behavior. And therefore, the dangers that Mieselson mentioned 
in 2000 become clearer and clearer. We have to think of ways in which we can guard this benignly intended work from misuse. So let me then turn to two ways in which we may be able, as neuroscientists, to do something to help. First of all, a specific example. Article 2.9D of the Chemical Weapons Convention tells you what purposes are not prohibited under this convention. So that these are the things that you can do peacefully. You are not in any way offending against the Chemical Weapons Convention ban. And most of these are perfectly understandable, perfectly reasonable. Industrial, agricultural, research, medical, pharmaceutical, and other peaceful purposes, protective purposes, and so on. But look at Article 2.9D. Law enforcement, including domestic riot control purposes. So this could be understood to mean that you're allowed to do domestic riot control using standard riot control agents, but it could also be taken to mean that there's a larger category of law enforcement chemicals that would also appear to be possible under the Chemical Weapons Convention. And what are those? Do, would some people think that they could develop better agents than derivatives of fentanyl and use those for law enforcement purposes? And where would that take us if we begin to go down that line? Well, some of the state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention clearly are concerned about this. So the paper produced by Australia for a meeting of the Chemical Weapons Convention state parties in November 2014, and it's headed, Weaponization of CNS Acting Chemicals for Law Enforcement. And they argue two points. First of all, it's not possible operationally to use such agents safely. You think about the Moscow theater siege, large number of people in a room, different kinds of people, some ill, some small, some old, agent being pumped in, different concentrations in different places. So you can't control the dose at any one place, and you can't understand the possible way in which any particular dose would, any, would attack the nervous system of any particular person. But also, they are worried that it would the development of these kind of agents would erode this, the prohibition. Because once you start going down that road, where do you stop? You know, if you get better fentanyls, maybe you find something even better, a different kind of neuronal network that could attack in a much more precise way. So Australia in 2014 set out this concern. And they came back to it again in 2015, here in a joint paper with 21 states, arguing that what we have to do is to actually continue this discussion of how we'll deal with this problem of Article 209D and law enforcement uh, chemicals and attempt to find a way in which we can agree a very narrow interpretation of what's possible. And this is likely to have to be dealt with very quickly. The next review conference of the Chemical Weapons Convention is in 2018. And hopefully this can all be brought together and an agreement made in 2018, which very narrowly interprets what can be done under Article 29D. In November, December of this year, at the analogous meeting, 33 state parties signed up to the Australian paper and Australian approach. Now here's a very, very specific example of where neuroscientists could pitch in and apply their expertise to helping with this process, both by making it 
by monitoring what's going on here and by, for instance, in their professional organizations, making clear that their professional organizations understand this issue and want to agree this kind of approach of narrowing down the possibilities. The situation in regard to the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention is more complex. Efforts to strengthen the convention with a verification system failed in 2001. And in 2001 and then in 2006, state parties agreed instead of trying to agree a verification system, agree to hold annual meetings and try to deal with issues which were perhaps more tractable. Advances in science and technology was one of the things that they tried to deal with. And in fact, in the last review conference in 2011, they actually agreed to have science and technology advances as one of the stand three standing agenda items that they would examine regularly in these annual meetings. Unfortunately, even with having science and technology advances as a standard uh, agenda item, it wasn't possible to make much progress. And many of us felt that the 2016 review conference would enhance a number of points to strengthen the convention, particularly in regard to advances in science and technology. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and very little was agreed in the 2016 review conference. So at the moment, it's unclear where the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention will take its discussions of uh, science and technology advances and how we can protect those advances against misuse. But one interpretation, I think the one that is most easy for us scientists to draw from the difficulties at the last review conference is that there is even more um, reason for scientists to take uh, an interest and try to help to deal with helping the state parties to understand what the implications of its advances are at the present time. One concept which has become very clear in regard to the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention is this idea of a web of prevention, that it's not just the scientists being responsible in their lab, but, for instance, proper public health measures, laboratory measures, the prohibition regime, export control systems, law enforcement systems, international standard systems, oversight and review of science and technology, and responsible conduct. All of these places and people involved allow the possibility of scientists assisting in helping to protect their work from misuse. So this general idea of a web of prevention is very widely understood amongst scientists who've been involved in these discussions. Unfortunately, in order to be able to take part in developing this web of uh, prevention, scientists need to understand the problem of dual use. And as the Royal Society in the UK pointed out in its Brain Waves Module 3 in 2012, like most other life scientists, neuroscientists have very little knowledge of the problem of dual use. And so here's a problem. How can you take part and apply your expertise in helping to strengthen this web of, of preventive policies if you don't know very much about it? And for that reason, Canada and the UK, under the Global Partnership, financed the development of a book of essays, uh, which was made freely available on the web last year, 
called Preventing Biological Threats, What You Can Do. And the first um, part of the book, um, this was an international group of, of scientists. For instance, Kuth van der Brungen works in the Netherlands, Catherine Nixdorf works in Germany, Maureen Ellis uh, is a Canadian, Jez Littlewood's a Canadian, and Catherine Jefferson and Graham Pearson both work in the UK. And the first part runs through quite a lot of the ma material I've been talking about here today. Um, the chapter two are, uh, by Coos goes through the long debate about dual use experiments in microbiology. Catherine Nixdorf takes through what happened to the science and technology during the Cold War period and how the, that information and knowledge was applied in, in offensive programs. And Catherine dealt with the uh, problem of uh, terrorism. Part two of the book goes through in much more detail uh, questions about scientists, organizations, and biosecurity. For instance, uh, chapter 10 by Joe Husbands and Catherine B Bowman from the US National Academies talks about how the International Academy panel has assisted sci uh, state parties to the Biological Weapons Convention to understand the implications of advances in science and technology by holding meetings and producing reports prior to uh, the review conferences. So let me. The remaining parts of the, of the book deal with issues such as uh, the s some s gives illustrations of some state parties who have developed complex uh, biosecurity systems within their states and looks at the role, for instance, of the FBI and Interpol as uh, organizations which are, have attempted to apply their expertise to um, preventing uh, misuse of the biolo biological sciences. And the book ends up by arguing that the best way of helping scientists to understand this issue is through various forms of active learning, in particular team-based learning. And therefore, another book produced by Tatiana Novoselova um, goes alongside the first book on preventing biological threats. And for each of the chapters, produces a team-based learning exercise, which can be used in order to teach this material to a large number of people. And the key thing about teams-based learning is that it's very easy to adapt and really easy to uh, replicate so that you can, if you've once done one of these teams-based learning exercises yourself, then you can very easily set it up so that you can teach it to other people. So what you have is a gearing mechanism for teaching this material. So my argument would be that given that all of this material in preventing biological threats and the follow-up book on team-based learning are freely available on the web, there's absolutely no reason why any neuroscientist should be ignorant of the problem of dual use. All you have to do is go online, read the chapters. If you, you find them very interesting, then set up a team-based learning exercise and tell your colleagues about it, and you will empower more and more uh, scientists to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Thank you very much.